And uh, before the break, we have a, a, a speaker. Uh, we have Chris Michaels here at Ozone, who will talk with us about RVRPs, the killer open banking apps. Open banking app. Uh, so, um, uh, Chris, perfect. We can see you. We can hear you. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you okay. The, your slides are full screen. That's great. The stage okay, is yours. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so thank you all and, uh, and welcome everyone. And um, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about VRPs and are they the killer open banking app? And uh, some of you may know what VRPs are and some of you may not. Um, so um, the um, just a very brief intro to myself. Um, my name is Chris Michael. I uh, the CEO and co-founder of Ozone. We're a technology company. We build open API software to help banks and financial institutions all over the world implement open banking and open finance. Um, we were founded in 2017 and we've gone through quite a rapid growth over the last few years and we are now providing services to, to banks pretty much all over the world. Um, and I think we're so to say we're the first platform now to be supporting this thing called variable recurring payments or VRPs. Um, prior, prior to Ozone, or actually in parallel with my role at Ozone, I was also leading the development of open banking standards in, in the UK. And I've been working for several years now with other standards bodies across the world in terms of uh, helping uh, publish and, and define open standards for open banking and open finance. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about these, these topics. So firstly, what are VRPs or variable recurring payments? I'm going to cover some of the example use cases and some of the regulatory and commercial considerations. I'm going to talk a bit about how, how they work, what's the design and implementation, uh, in, 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 the uh, design and implementation considerations, and a little bit about when they'll be in market, and then we'll, we'll leave some time for questions. Um, before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to this as well. So um, open banking, if it's done well, it's a life enhancing activity for banks. But actually, it's more than that. It's it's a good thing for uh, third parties. It's a good thing for regulators. But ultimately, open banking is there to help customers, uh, banking customers, both personal and business banking customers. Um, and um what we've seen in the UK is that, and, and Europe is that, uh, since the regulations came into force a few years ago, um, there's been quite a significant growth, a growth in the number of third parties who are using these APIs and providing services to the market. Um, there is um, a significant growth in the number of API calls in the UK and in the volumes of payments particularly. But we've, we, we're seeing... Um, now getting on for 6 billion API calls uh, last year. Um, and um, this, this is growing very significantly. And, and a big driver of growth, the initial growth in API volumes was um, accounts information, stroke aggregation, use cases. Um, so this is third parties uh, providing services, for example, for wealth management, financial management and planning, uh, business accounts, uh, uh, reconciliation, those sorts of use cases. Um, but the real growth recently is, is being driven by, by payments, payments initiation APIs. And, and these are the, the, the sort of use cases that we're seeing. And I mentioned a few of them, personal finance, debt, debt advice, investment tools, mortgage applications. And then for, 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 for businesses, we're seeing things like, um, I mentioned accountancy, but tax, tax management, cash flow management, et cetera, debt management. Um, payments has been really the, the, the poor cousin, if you like, of this, because payments APIs haven't really taken off. Although recently, um, a couple of months ago, there was a major milestone reached in the UK that a billion pound of UK tax payments were made via open banking. In fact, uh, pay, pay, paying directly from your bank account with an open banking API is now the, uh, the, the kind of number one priority for HMRC in terms of gathering, uh, gathering payments. Um, so there are some benefits of open banking payments as they stand on their own because uh, the customer doesn't have to enter the details, the, 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 the name, the sort code and account number, et cetera, of the 
uh, of the payee uh, that can be provided by the the PISP, the merchant, in this case, the the government website. So it significantly cuts down on um, uh, what I call fat fingers, people typing the wrong details and payments going to the wrong place. Um, but it also provides quite a seamless process if, if the authentication is good because the customer can, um, particularly if they're on a mobile device, can use the biometrics in their mobile banking app to authenticate a payment. So these are kind of payment use cases, and this is the first one that sort of B2B payments or uh, 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 making it easy for business banking customers to pay staff, suppliers, or government services. But we're also there is also a significant potential for open banking to provide additional use cases or, or uh, payment use cases. So things like one-click payments online, um, point-of-sale payments, uh, subscription payments where you're paying repeat um, personal business customers, uh, utility utilities, memberships, donations, etc. The amount might vary every time. Sweeping, which is defined as, as automating the movement of money between accounts that, that, that you, you own. So you might want to pay top-ups into a savings account you own or to pay off a loan in, in, in small increments that might vary each time. Peer-to-peer -peer payments, bill splitting, family allowances, etc., um, potentially integrating with online wallets. And then there's a whole load of other things that payment APIs could be used for. Um, uh, so automated payments for smart devices, speakers, cars, wearables. Now, open banking payments in theory can enable all of this, but the, the key limiting factor is that as, as they have been implemented up until now across um, the, uh, the, the, the UK and, and globally is that um, the payment APIs uh, require the customer, or the way they've been implemented, require the customer to authenticate every single payment by effectively redirecting to their banking website or banking app to use strong customer authentication and authenticate. Now, if you're making a payment on a mobile uh, web, uh, a mobile app and you're redirected directly into your mobile banking app, you authenticate with your face or thumb and, and initiate the payment that way. It's not such a bad experience, but you know, certainly some of the kind of B2B payment examples kind of work quite well in that way. But all of the other use cases, the, the retail stuff, I mean, an open bank payment doesn't work well if you're in a store because there's no, the, the, the banks haven't implemented what, what's called a decoupled flow where you start the payment initiation on one device, i.e. a point of sale um, terminal in a, in a shop. And you, how do you then transfer the user to uh, a, a device on your on your mobile, uh, 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 your a banking app on your mobile device to to authenticate the payment? So the standards that that, that we developed in the UK do do enable those uh, decoupled use cases, but uh, the banks haven't implemented them. And certainly, the banks have required authentication for each and every payment. So what? What VRPs do is they effectively get around all of that and enable all of that because and I'm not going to read this out, but they take the principle of a, a PISP open banking payment. But the thing that gets authenticated is a consent. And that consent is similar to the same consent you've got for account information. It's a long lived consent that contains a set of parameters that gives the, 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 the PISP in this case a token that the PISP can use within those consent parameters to initiate subsequent payments. Um, so that token allows the PISP to make payments within some tightly controlled parameters that the customer does not have to authenticate every time, or certainly not with the bank. They could authenticate with the PISP. And so what that does is it enables for repeating payments that can vary by amount, i.e. variable recurring payments, um, and uh, that enables all of these use cases. And so in the UK, we, we defined a set of um, customer experience guidelines that, that, that illustrate the setup of that VRP consent. So on the first screen there, this, this is a set of sort of mobile wireframes that are indicative, really, if you like. But what, what the first screen shows is the VRP consent being set up. So the customer here is agreeing who the merchant is in this case, what's their sort code and account number, any references. And then there's a set of parameters. In this case, the maximum amount of payments per month, the maximum amount per payment, 
and the period of over which this is valid. And then the customer selects which account or accounts they want to make that payment from. And when they click on the second screen that they allow, they are then required to authenticate in their banking app, uh, in this case, using biometrics. Um, what you can see is a, effectively a replay of those consent parameters. And then in the fourth screen on the right, the customer is redirected back to the, the PISP or the, or the merchant. Um, and the consent setup has been confirmed. So what's happened in the background, I'm going to explain in a bit. But uh, what you can see here is these set of parameters, we've just picked this as examples around uh, who, who's, who's, who are you agreeing to pay? How much are you agreeing to pay per month? How much are you agreeing to pay for individual payments and for how long? Those parameters are quite flexible and can be designed for quite a lot of different use cases. So what's going on behind the scenes is effectively a six step process. So we've got the customer or the PSU in the, in, in the top right of the triangle. So top left and the top right, we've got the third party, the PISP. And in the bottom, we've got the ASPSP or the bank. So what's happening behind the scenes here is that the customer is agreeing the consent parameters that we discussed previously with the, the PISP. The PISP then sends those consent parameters to the um, consent resource server of the ASPSP. Obviously, uh, behind the scenes as well, what I haven't described is all of the certificate exchange and, and validation that it is a valid, a valid, uh, a valid uh, third party and that the, uh, the, the handshaking that goes on there. But effectively, the, the, the consent object is being set up. Um, at this point in time, as per any open banking API flow, um, the, the bank doesn't know who the customer is, but the, the PISP effectively redirects the customer then to the bank. And the customer in step three authorizes that payment using that payment consent object, the VRP consent object. They authorize that using strong customer authentication. Now, that redirect, that could be a decoupled flow. It could be um, a web experience, it could be a mobile app experience. I mean, that's that's entirely in the kind of competitive space. The key thing there is that the customer then has identified themselves and, and, and the authentication of that customer and authorization is linked to the consent object. So um, what has happened behind the scenes then is the third party has then got a token uh, that gives them uh, the, the right of access, if you like, to initiate subsequent payments without the customer having to authenticate with the bank every time because the token defines the parameters. There are some optional steps then. Every time the TPP is uh, uh, either wishes to or is instructed by the customer to make a payment, it could be because a gas bill, for example, is due if it's a bill payment uh, use case, then the TPP can initiate that payment by sending a, uh, a post to the uh, Payments Initiation API. Before that, they can do a confirmation of funds. Um, they can check that the funds are in the customer's bank account before they initiate the payment. This isn't a balance check. There is a difference. This isn't saying how much money has the customer got. This is saying, as a PISP, I'm about to initiate a payment of £100. Will that payment be successful effectively? Does the customer have that balance? Um, and if yes, then the, the, the payment is uh, initiated. And that's step five, which is creating the immediate payment order. And then subsequent to that, the PISP can get the status of that to confirm that the payment order has been accepted. So those are the steps and that's the flow. Um, there's obviously a set of, of, of detailed specifications, um, API specifications behind that. That define all the uh, all the parameters of the uh, uh, the, the endpoints, the uh, the data model, the um, each each uh, each post, each get, etc. That's all defined in the in, in in the UK standard. So what what that does um, then is 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 enables um, it, that standard enables the, um, the the setup and the subsequent payment um, uh, initiation. Now, obviously, there are other things that the PISP can do, and this is where it gets interesting, because the PISP can create all sorts of other experiences for the customer around that. So the PISP could notify the customer every time they're about to make a payment. They could notify them if there aren't enough funds to make the payment. They could notify them 
in real time once the payment has been successfully made. And all of this is in the competitive space. But what it enables is a very slick customer experience for subsequent payments because it's between the PISP and whatever their business model is and whatever the use case is, it's between the PISP and the customer how that experience is managed. Um, and, 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 and this gets really powerful and can enable all of those use cases that I showed on, on, on the previous slide. Now, um, what we've been doing is we, uh, we, the standard was published some time ago, um, actually at the end of, um, I think it was published at the end of March um, this year. Um, there's been a subsequent version that was just published last month with, with, with some updates. Um, and um, there is a, uh, a kind of interesting regulatory um, scenario here, if you like. Um, so this is something that is largely in the optional space for implementation. There is no mandate for the banks to implement VRPs, certainly across Europe. There was recently in March, it was, um, there was a mandate. In fact, I don't think it was actually in March. It was subsequent to March. I think it was uh, around about the middle of this year. There was a mandate for the CMA 9. The nine largest retail banks in the UK were mandated under the competition, the CMA market order. They were mandated to implement VRPs for one use case and one use case only, which is sweeping. So what that means is that the nine largest banks in the UK are building uh, VRP um, APIs for sweeping use cases, but they can then use those APIs that they've built for all sorts of other use cases, and that can be in the competitive space. They could offer that as a, a chargeable service. And for that matter, any other bank in the UK, Europe, the rest of the world could also take this standard and offer it as a, as a commercial service, which gets very interesting. Um, what, what we've done in, in Ozone is we've created a sandbox, which has got a full version of uh, of this API. I'm not going to go through all of this in detail, but we've been using this to sponsor a hackathon, which is the entries of uh, an, an entry date that has just passed. So we're going through the process of evaluating all the entries in this hackathon. But the sandbox is effectively a fully working version of these VRP APIs. So it includes all the documentation around uh, VRPs, how they, how they work, all the different steps, all the different um, uh, requirements and clarifications around things like error codes, risk scoring information. There's a full set of reference, uh, reference the API references here, all the, all the swagger files here. For example, I talks about confirmation of funds. That's all defined here. So this sandbox is not only the documentation, but also there's a set of resources where firms can register um, and can get certificates and actually download Postman collections and access all of the um, all of the APIs. And uh, there's a whole load of um, getting started guides and video guides there. So this is a real thing. We have. Um, we, we built a sandbox that implements it. We are in the process of implementing it for a number of banks as well. But the CMA9 are also implementing this in the, uh, in the UK for uh, payment uh, for sweeping use cases. Um, so just to kind of sum up here, there are quite a few benefits versus other payment methods. I mean, one of the challenges that we have with other payment methods is either a lack of security or a lack of transparency or... Um, sometimes um, uh, just uh, a, a additional cost and friction. Um, single immediate payments don't support many of the use cases that I showed earlier because the customer has to authenticate every one. Direct debits are somewhat flawed for things like bill payments. If the bill payment varies because the merchant um, or re uh, utility company, for example, if it's a gas bill, has to provide several days notification before making the payment if it's uh, a different amount from previously. Cards on file are somewhat um, uh, dubious as to <laughs> the, uh, uh, the the security of that. And um, uh, we, we've probably all got horror stories about uh, not knowing how many merchants we've given our card details to and have stored them on file. Yes, there are protections in place for all of that. But the net result is that VRPs offer a really strong mitigation to all of these, uh, all of these other payment methods and, and the risks associated with them. They're based on the widely adopted model of open banking, so they they afford all the protections for customers under PSD2. They are accessible to all regulated PISPs, so you've instantly got a very wide 
um, several hundred firms who can provide services. And they're based on you know, the secure model of open banking APIs based on the FAPI security profiles, strong customer authentication, et cetera. They should be a lot lower cost because firms have already implemented most of the requirements of PISP APIs and should be able to extend for VRP at a relatively low cost. So they should be able to be offered to the ecosystem at a lower cost than, than cards and card rails. Um, they enable a, a, seam, a great customer experience, both seamless and friction-free payments, but also complete control and transparency, as I described earlier. Um, and therefore, they enable almost any use case and should become a real driver of innovation. And last, but by no means least, they are due for implementation by the CMA9, albeit just for sweeping early next year. So these are this is a real thing. It's coming into the market uh, next year in the UK. And um, yeah, really excited about uh, seeing how this can enable a whole range of different use cases. And uh, that's why I stand by what I said right at the start. I think this is really genuinely a, a killer app for open banking. Um, yep. So yes, I think, I think that, was that, that, that was my talk. I just uh, wanted to know if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Chris, uh, for that. Uh, one question um, about like the link between, let's say, um, the, what the regulation happened, how let's say the payment industry go, went beyond uh, regulation. Also for other countries who are regulation coming, like how to make, uh, how to enable the ecosystem to to go beyond regulation faster than uh, that could have happened in Europe or in UK. Yeah, so I think I think it's fair to say, as a as a as a general theme, when when open banking started in the UK and and across Europe, it was very much seen as a as a kind of compliance uh, exercise by the banks. Most of them were doing it because they were told to and didn't really want to and and felt that it was going to cost them money, which it did. Uh, they couldn't see the, the immediate benefit. They thought that what they were doing is providing free services to a market that was going to compete with them. And they felt themselves that it was anti-competitive. So I think, you know, probably many, not all, but many, if not most of the banks across UK and Europe started open banking, uh, should we say, reluctantly. <laughs> and therefore, they didn't necessarily do a very good job the first time round. And also, they, you know, they were struggling with uh, some of these emerging technologies and their lack of vendor support for a lot of the standards, etc. So it wasn't easy for them at all. What, what's happened along the way is I think the, the penny started to drop um, for some, not all of the banks, that they've started to realize that actually having a good API is a really great thing to, 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 to have as a bank because what you can do is work with third parties as partners rather than as competitors, and you can offer new services to your customer. And if, it, if the customer is demanding and asking those service, for those services, then if you don't have a great API that enables third-party services, then you are losing out because ultimately you will lose customers and won't be able to win new customers. So APIs are starting to become right at the core. And by APIs, I don't mean just any APIs. I'm talking about specifically this new form of open APIs are really starting to become very important strategic uh, imperatives for banks. And what we're seeing now in other markets, Brazil is a really great example. In Brazil, um, the, 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 the hot, you know, you've got... Uh, something like a thousand banks who are in scope of the open bank open finance regulation and right now a very large number of those banks are also actively looking to build their own open banking services to consume the apis of other banks so you're seeing now that the people who are leading um the open banking programs within banks are not really compliance people anymore they're starting to be commercial people or technical people or product people because the banks are looking at this as a, as a, as a kind of new, new product development strategy. Yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, when the shift, when the salespeople get into the, <laughs> into the, into the job, that means it's, uh, it's really a business uh, uh, concern, not just a compliance concern. So we reach our, our time perfectly. Thank you very much, uh, Chris.